5. And this morning we're in John chapter 5, verses 39 and 40. John chapter 5 is about power and authority and testimony. And the last couple of weeks, through Jesus' monologue, talking to this group of Jews who are trying to kill him, it's all about eyewitness testimony authenticating who Jesus is and how Jesus is on task. This morning, Jesus will turn to refer to scriptures. This is important for us because we tend to take something good and use it for bad. In fact, we're very good at taking something good and using it for bad. There are so many examples, it's absolutely overwhelming. Every, it seems like every single medical advancement becomes biological warfare. Every, every technological development becomes armament. You get the automobile, and then you have the tank. Every time technology takes an advance, we use it for evil and wickedness. So our smartphones shouldn't really be called smart, right? It's what we're good at. And Jesus calls us on this in these verses of John chapter 5, verses 39 through 40. Taking something good and using it for bad. Now I want to give us some context. We've been slow rolling through John 5, but I want to give us some context for verses 39 and 40 by reading John 5, verses 33 through 40. So you see what he's been talking about beforehand. So John 5, verses 33 through 40 says this, my friends. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father have given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither neither heard his voice at any time or seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. All right, scripture passage from last week. New verses. You search the scriptures... Because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. 39 and 40 in that context about testimony and eyewitness. All red letters by Jesus. All right, let me... I know we're only dealing with two verses, and I've only got like five points, but um, let let me break it down into a sermon and a sentence so I don't get lost. The five points are clumped into two bigger points, but we're going to talk about the Bible and Jesus, and we're going to talk about us through both of them, so Bible and Jesus. So let's look at the sermon and the sentence, a topic sentence that we can hang all the details on so that we won't get too lost. Um, in the weeds. The sermon on the sentence says this, my friends. The Bible testifies about Jesus as an invitation to come to him and have life. The Bible testifies about Jesus as an invitation to come to him and have life. Now, because we are so good at taking good things and, you know, using them for bad we know that we struggle with our Bible because we either ignore the Bible or we use it to abuse others or mistreat what it actually says. That's the danger for us. 
Now when Jesus is talking to these Jewish crowd who is trying to kill him, when he talks about the scripture, he's not actually talking about our Bible. When he talks about the scripture, he's referring to the Old Testament. The New Testament hasn't been written yet. So Jesus is talking to a crowd of Jews about the scriptures of the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament absolutely is God's inspired truth. The New Testament is as well God's inspired truth. But the Old Testament too. The Old Testament is very important for us. And we tend, as Baptists, to get obsessed with the New Testament Pauline epistles and ignore the Old Testament for some reason. And we really shouldn't do that. The Old Testament speaks God's truth. And Jesus is talking to an audience that knew the Old Testament well. And you and I should learn and know the Old Testament well for for four easy reasons. First, the Old Testament explains God's plan of salvation. The Old Testament talks about how God made the good, Genesis 1 and 2, and we broke it. So that the reason there is evil, sin, violence, horror, self-destruction in the world is not God's fault, He made it good. It's us. The reason there's sin, violence, evil, horror in the world is because of you and me. We're the disease. We broke it. So God created good. We brought evil into the world. And God brings the cure to that. So he's able to rescue the wicked, evil sinner on a path of self-destruction. And God is able to step in the midst of that and rescue us from the fate that we are earning and deserve. And that plan is in the Old Testament. A plan of relationship, of covenant, of death and blood bringing healing. It's a beautiful thing. We need to know our Old Testament. Because it reveals God's plan of salvation. The foundation for the New Testament. We need to know the Old Testament because it is God's inspired word. And it reveals God's will. God's will, God's plan, God's method. You don't have to go to the magic eight ball to figure out God's will. Come back later. All you got to do is go to God's inspired word where his word reveals his will for humanity, for Leighton Hills Baptist Church, for my family, for me. In the Old Testament, you have the will of God revealed to us in a love letter from him to humanity where he spells out what he is trying to do. He is trying to reach out into humanity as a holy God to an evil, wicked, rebellious people. He is trying to adopt us who are the rebellious, wayward child. And he wants to bring us into his household, into his family, into his bosom. He has a method, a plan, a will for us collectively and for you individually. We need to know the Old Testament. His will is revealed in the Old Testament. The third reason we need to read, study, know the Old Testament is because it reveals God. It tells us about God's character, His nature who he is, and what he does. You can't know God without knowing the Old Testament. 
We get to see him act where he is pursuing us instead of us pursuing him. He's the lover calling out to the beloved. It's God trying to woo us. That tells us an awful lot about his nature, his character, who he is and what he is doing. The Old Testament reveals to us God's absolute holiness, purity, innocence, holy, 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 in terms that we can't even comprehend. He has a purity that we cannot compare him to at all. And then it's in the Old Testament that he tries to reveal that holiness and innocence and purity to us, even though he knows we have a hard time understanding. We need to know the Old Testament because it reveals him. We get to see God work in mercy and grace. Not just giving second chances. I love Israel. The Jewish people are such an example to me. Primarily because they're such a bad example. And I learn better from bad examples. I mean, if, they, if it could be screwed up, the Israelites screwed it up, right? I mean, you get to the book of Joshua, you get to the judges. Oh, the judges. You don't get too far into Israel's history before you realize that every opportunity to do it wrong, they do it wrong. I totally can relate to that, right? Can't you relate to that? There's nothing like relating to somebody who tries but fails over and over and over again. Makes me feel better. Because God not only gives Israel a second chance, God gives Israel a 35th chance, a 75th chance, a millionth chance. God is patient and long-suffering in his faithfulness and his goodness in a way that uh, I, I'm not. <laughs> you know? um, again, it, it speaks to God's nature and character. So we need to know the Old Testament to know God. The Bible is not divided up between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. Same God, same story, same truth. We need to know the Old Testament. For the fourth reason we need to know the Old Testament, the Old Testament has a section in the center. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Job, which are called, they're classified, they're lumped together, and they're categorized as wisdom literature. Wisdom literature. We need to know the Old Testament because, brother, we need some divine advice. We need to hear a voice from the divine on how to live our life because we don't know nothing. And all of our advisors don't know nothing. All the voices we listen to trying to tell us how to be better people and better spouses, better employees and better citizens and better children and better parents, it's the blind leading the blind. And you know that. It's why we ignore advice so quickly. But God's divine wisdom lays it out true. It transcends what millennia it is, what century it is. It transcends what culture you're from, what echoes social economical status. It transcends all of that and speaks truth into our lives on this is how you can live on a Wednesday morning. Wisdom literature. We need to know our Old Testament because we need to hear God's wisdom. This speaks loud to me because I'm toward the end of a four-month Bible study on Ecclesiastes. In fact, I've got one video left and that's on Wednesday and it's finally good news. I'm looking forward to it. It's like sp spring. Spring will arrive on Wednesday in Ecclesiastes. And Ecclesiastes talks about the purpose of of me being alive. Don't you want to know the purpose of you being alive? That's the book of Ecclesiastes. 
Don't you want to know how to suffer? How to be patient in the midst of suffering because we are all suffering? That's the book of Job. Don't you want to know how to relate in this world with your boss, with your mother-in-law, with your spouse, with your children? How to get along in the state of Utah, in the United States? That's the book of Proverbs. It lays it all out for us. Don't you want to know how a forgiven sinner living in an evil, corrupt world could possibly Worship and honor their holy God? That's Psalms. Don't you want to know how to be a romantic? Woo the other gender. Share your heart. That's what Song of Songs is about. Don't we need all that stuff? The fourth reason we need to read the Old Testament and learn the Old Testament is because we, we need that kind of wisdom. We need that kind of wisdom abundantly. You know it. I know it. Yeah, it's important. It's important. That all flows straight out of John 5.39. John 5.39. You search the Scriptures. He's kind of praising the Jewish people for knowing their scriptures. I would hope he would praise you and I for us knowing the scriptures. We've got a Bible reading plan, one chapter a day. We've got scripture memory verse where we spend four months trying to learn one sentence. We've got Sunday school discipleship classes, stuff available. You search the scriptures, praise the Lord. The Bible talks an awful lot about the Bible. Um, this is just one verse where Jesus is referring about the Scriptures, and the Scriptures talk an awful lot about the Scriptures, and you probably have your favorite verses in the Bible where there's a sentence in the Bible talking about the Bible. I just know I have my favorites, and, and there are a lot of them. I just want to highlight John's favorite four. I did four reasons for why you should read the Old Testament. I figured I'd stop. I'd cap myself at my favorite four verses beyond John 5, uh, 5 verse 39. Let's look at those four verses. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua has this sentence in it. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Shall not depart from your mouth doesn't mean you shouldn't speak it. It means you won't lose it. You should meditate on it day and night. We ought to be pondering it. And then look at what it says. So that you may be careful to do application according to all that is written in it. For then, it's got a promise in this verse. For then, you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. This verse has it all. May we be meditators of the word day and night, doing what it says, right? How awesome is that? All right, uh, w one down. I, if I spend too much time, yeah, I know. Uh, this, the second one, still in Old Testament. Psalm 119, longest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 9, asks this big question and answers it. Psalm 119, verse 9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure, innocent, holy, godly? By keeping it according to your word. By living by the scriptures you can live in a way that will be pure in a world of filth. Psalm 119, the entire Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, the whole Psalm is actually about the Word of God. I shelled self-control and I only quoted one verse. Okay, uh, moving on, moving on, moving on. How about New Testament now? Second Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. You've got this one memorized. 
all Scripture is inspired, God-breathed by God, and profitable for four things. For teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So that, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Isn't that awesome? All Scripture serves those four functions. Even the boring parts. <laughs> Even the, the long genealogy of names we can't say. The locations. Multiple syllables. It all serves a divine purpose in our lives to equip us. To equip us. Let me stay in 2 Timothy for my fourth one. Um, and just jump down to chapter 4. And really, uh, I should read the whole paragraph in chapter 4. But instead, I'll do just verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2 says, <laughs> Preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. That ought to be my life verse. It's not, but it should be. You know the part of this verse that really wears me down? Great patience. Yeah, you're right. right? That's, I mean, not just patience, but he sticks great in front of there. You know, it's not just a punch to the gut. It's a double punch with great patience. <sighs> That's why we ought to be committed personally, individually, to the Word of God, to the Bible, to the Scriptures. Reading it. Learning it. Memorizing it. Meditating on it. Pondering it. Applying it to our lives so that we would be doers of the Word instead of hearers of the Word. All right, let, let's go back to John chapter 5, verse 39, before I get too far away. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Let's just look at that. Because you think that in them you have eternal life. This is the opportunity of misuse. This is where Jesus is rebuking his Jewish audience. The Jewish audience of Jesus' day, they had the Old Testament. They knew the Old Testament was given to them by God as a gift. And they took that with great assumption. And it puffed them up and they, it made them proud. And they started to think and teach and behave in such a way that God has given me the word, therefore, look how special I am. Because I have the Bible, I have eternal life, regardless of anything else. They turned, they turned the Bible into an idol. They thought simply because they owned a big Bible from grandma, they were going to heaven. It became about the, the text, the book, the scrolls. And it had nothing to do with their relationship with God, with their own sinfulness, with their need. They turned God's word into an idol and this, a source of life apart from God. It's a, it's a misdirection. They took a good thing and they turned it into a bad thing. Like we admitted earlier, we're all good at. We see this everywhere. It's a problem today. It's a huge problem today. People can be knowledgeable of the Bible. They can be experts of the Bible. And yet they can lack godliness, compassion, any kind of kindness or love for God or love for people. They simply 
They have the head knowledge, the book knowledge, but there's no relationship, there's no spirit, there's no giftedness, there's no fruit. We're drowning in a culture of that, my friends. We need to remember that even the devil comes quoting Scripture. In the Garden of Eden, the devil, the serpent, quotes God to Eve and changes one word. Totally changing what God meant. Jesus, in the wilderness, with the temptations, Jesus laid down Scripture to shut the devil up. We see this everywhere. Bible scholars who don't actually have a relationship with Jesus. Quoting Scripture like the devil. We see this when the self-righteous abuse others by using the Bible. So they nitpick a series of rules that they want to beat you over the head with. And it's horrible. It's horrible. And yet, it's incredibly common. It's a means of control. And it totally brutalizes the next generation. And it's the next generation that are so wounded so bleeding from that that they they hate God and they hate the Bible and they hate anything associated with anything like that because they're the walking wounded they've been hit over the head too many times by a hard bound Bible from somebody that was expressing hate instead of love who is trying to control instead of uplift. We see it in prideful experts with inflated senses of self who try to intimidate others. They want to win arguments. They want to divide people. So if you don't agree with my 37 points, then you're obviously a sinner and you are a wolf among the sheep. You're the weed among the wheat. You're the enemy. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Jesus was calling the Jews on it. You search the scriptures, but you misuse, misabuse, misdirect. And my friends... Because you and I love Jesus and we are studying the Word to understand the nature of God, the plan of God, who God is and God's will for us, it's a pretty easy trap for you and me to fall into. And we'll fall hard and we'll be doing it without realizing it. And we'll be the ones using and abusing. We'll be the ones being puffed up with pride because I know something you don't. And all of a sudden, we're part of the problem. Let's not ignore Scripture. Let's not abuse Scripture. Instead, let us Read it, study it like the love letter it is, and then obey it for ourselves. Do it. I mean, boy, if we spent all that energy trying to walk the walk that God has called us to, we wouldn't have enough attention time left to beat other people up with it. If only the Jews of Jesus' day had heard this from him. You search the scriptures because you think that is in them you have eternal life. Let's not be, make the Bible an idol. Instead, let's, let's live it. Because it's meant to be lived. We can do it, my friends. All right, all right done. Bible.
But okay, let's go back to the sermon on the sentence before I get myself lost. The Bible testifies about Jesus as an invitation to come to Him and have life. All right, so we've covered the Bible testifies. All right, maybe we've covered just the Bible. Let's look at the second big idea, and that's Jesus. So I'm going to be talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus from here on out. We need to stay focused and be stay focused in on Jesus, and we need to major on the majors and minor on the minors. We need to major on the essentials. So let's look at verse 39 again, because verse 39 and verse 40 all talk about Jesus. Verse 39. We looked at you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. That's what Jesus says. It is these that testify about me. The whole Bible's topic is... Jesus Christ. If you wanted to know what the Bible is about, the Bible is about Jesus. The Bible is about Jesus. The Bible is about Jesus. So when we look at the genealogies that drive us crazy, the genealogies are about Jesus. When we look at the law and all the difficulty about planting crops beside each other and all of that stuff, it's about Jesus. When we look at all the geography and the locations of names, that we wish were one syllable, maybe just a consonant, a vowel, and a consonant. It's all about Jesus. There's Jesus on every page of the Old Testament. There's Jesus on every page of the New Testament. It's all about Jesus. Now, he's talking specifically about the Old Testament. The Old Testament is about Jesus. The Old Testament is about how Jesus is on his way to humanity, but it's also about Jesus in a multitude of other ways. It's about Jesus when there's Jesus prophecies. There's a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament, foretellings of God about Jesus on his way. Depending on how you count them, if you want to narrowly count them, there's over 400. If you have a more moderate interpretation, there's a thousand prophecies about the Messiah. But you assume there's going to be prophecies about the Messiah. Genesis chapter 3, you know, where the, the, head, the ankle's going to get bit and the head's going to get crushed. It's about the Messiah. Okay, but there's also the people in the Old Testament, the historical real people, they are they represent, they are types of deliverers, saviors. They are foreshadows of Jesus as well. So that Noah and Noah's ark is actually about Jesus. Noah is a type of person like Jesus. The boat is a type of person like Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus everywhere. Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac. Isaac is a symbol, a type a picture, a representation of Jesus. The lamb that gets killed instead of Isaac is also a picture of Jesus. Joseph, who gets sold by his family into slavery, ends up in prison as an innocent man, becomes the second most powerful person in Egypt. Joseph is a symbol of Jesus. Joshua going into the promised land. Military conquest. Joshua is a type of Jesus. Moses is a type of Jesus. David is a type of Jesus. Elijah, Elisha, types of Jesus. Solomon is a type of Jesus. All the prophets are a type of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Where an individual, a historical person, is also a picture of Jesus to come. It's even a good Bible study idea to read about some dude in the book of Judges and say, how is that guy like Jesus or pointing to Jesus? And hopefully you, you focus in on one of the guys whose you know, names are easier to pronounce. I, I, I struggle with that. Even beyond prophecies and people, there's also symbols. And symbols get us all confused. Symbols, an inanimate object that also speaks toward Jesus. The, the ark, the boat that rescues people is a type of, Symbol for Jesus? How about the rock in the wilderness that water flows from? The rock 
is a symbol of Jesus because he is the rock and living water flows from him. How about where there's a pond, there's a lake of poisonous water and it's the only water to drink and so they throw a tree into the water and an act of throwing a tree into the water purifies the water. The tree, which brings purity to the poisoned, is a type of Jesus. Symbols. When we get lost in the book of Exodus or lost in the book of Deuteronomy, when they lay out the blueprints for the place of worship, almost everything in the blueprint is a reference to Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's all there, my friends. The Bible is about Jesus. So let's be people of the book and stay focused in on Jesus. He keeps talking after this, though. It is these that testify about me. So Jesus is saying, the scriptures speak of him, but he keeps talking. Verse 40, and you are unwilling to come to me. You are unwilling to come to me. To know the Bible alone is not enough. To just memorize the Bible isn't enough. We like historical bad guys. You know, Osama bin Laden, the epitome of evil. The generation before 9-11, it was Hitler, the epitome of evil. If you've got a little broader context, you have Stalin, the epitome of evil. Stalin is, of course, the leader of the USSR during World War II. He was an ally of ours against Hitler, even though he was just as evil horrible Stalin. Did you know when Stalin was a young man, a priest gave treats for scripture memory. And the kids of the village that would come to him and recite an entire chapter got a treat, some candy. And the number one scripture memory person of the village that received the most treats throughout his childhood was Stalin. Stalin memorized more scripture than you or me, and history will remember him as a heinous butcher, crimes against humanity, so that he gets mentioned in the same breath as Hitler and Osama bin Laden. Knowing the Bible alone isn't enough. And I, it pains me to say it, and if you take that out of context, uh, I'm in all kinds of trouble. But it's true. Just head knowledge doesn't do anything if it doesn't lead you to God. Memory or facts is not the same thing as salvation in the Savior. It has to lead to salvation in the Savior. The The devil knows the Bible, and the devil does not have a positive relationship with the Savior. The stiff-necked, self-righteous, they abuse the Bible, and they don't have a relationship with the Savior. The Pharisees of Jesus' day had more Scripture memorized than you and I ever will, and they were the enemies of God. Let's not make the mistake of turning something good, inspired from God that is a gift, into something bad. Having the scriptures alone is not the same thing as having a relationship and being saved by the Savior. And so my friends, don't just know. Ponder. Make it a part of you. Obey it. Surrender it in the relationship you have. Let's not be abusers or idolaters or twisters of scripture. Especially, oh, no. Let's just do it. 
Let's, let's walk with Jesus and live his word as we're supposed to. You are unwilling to come to me, Jesus said to them. May that not be true for you and I. May we not reject the opportunity to come to Jesus and stay with him. The verse keeps going, obviously, right? So you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. It's coming to Jesus that brings you life. It's coming to Jesus that brings you eternal life. It's coming to Jesus that rescues you from your sins. It's coming to Jesus that makes you adopted into the family of God. It's coming to Jesus that makes you a part of the kingdom of God. You need the scriptures, yes, 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 yes. But the scriptures aren't the Savior. They just aren't. Jesus is life. Jesus gives life to those who believe in him. I'm reminded of Paul. Right? Paul, Saul, a Pharisee of Pharisees who studied under the greatest teacher, who had more scripture memorized than anybody, who was a persecutor of the church. He was arresting Christians, executing Christians. He was there when Stephen was murdered and martyred. He knew the word, but he didn't have a relationship with the Savior until he's done such a good job persecuting the church, he takes his persecution on the road. And while traveling with his friends to Damascus to carry the mission internationally, he meets Jesus and everything changes. He becomes the living He meets Jesus and he comes to life. And everything changes for Paul, Saul. May that be you and I. Come for life. Come to Jesus for life because that's what he's promising. Come to Jesus for life knowing that he's going to do something powerful and beautiful in your life. Not only will he forgive you of your sins, your evil, your wickedness, your wrongdoing, which is a lot. We're all very guilty. But he'll also pour out his love on you and his spirit on you and give you a divine purpose, a meaning of life. And then he will work in a very powerful way in and through you as a servant within his kingdom. Jesus' audience wanted to kill him. I hope that doesn't describe you. I hope instead you want to come to Jesus and have the life that he offers. The invitation is there to come to him and to receive what he has to offer. If we'll just just say yes and take him seriously on it, my friends, and come to Jesus.